When clients work with you, how do you suppose they would describe their customer experience? Would it be responsive, easy, approachable? Well, that's certainly what we want customers to think. Unfortunately, working with companies for over 30 years to enhance customer experience, we've discovered that even well-established companies have some customer experience turnoffs. So if you were to ask customers what it's like to do business, they're more likely to use words like rigid, robotic, and bureaucratic. That's why in this video, I'm going to share four of the most common customer experience spoilers and how to avoid them. Be sure to watch this video right until the end because this last customer turnoff is one I see most often. And the good news is it's easy to fix. There is something to keep in mind about these customer experience turnoffs, and it's that customers may not consciously be aware of them. What they will do is quietly choose another supplier next time. See if any of these four customer experience ruiners are oozing through the cracks of your company's foundations. The first of our four customer experience turnoffs is punishing policies. You already know the importance of building a brand that instills trust. Unfortunately, when companies operate with overly restrictive policies, well, all that goodwill begins to crumble. Half the problem is the word policy. It implies rigid rules and regulations. To avoid this turnoff, customer-friendly organizations replace the word policy with guideline. For example, delivery guideline. We typically schedule deliveries within X days. Let us know your timing and we'll see if we can accommodate. You notice how that wording sounds like real people who are trying to be helpful? I'm not suggesting that companies abandon policies. Instead, dial down the legal jargon, soften the wording, and make it sound like your company is run by humans. If this video is making sense to you, then be sure to like and subscribe so that as I release new videos, you'll be notified right away. That brings us to customer experience turnoff number two, and that is complex contracts. In order to do business with you, are your customers forced to jump through multiple regulations, rules, or hoops before they can actually get the products or services that you're offering? Do your contracts sound like you expect to be sued? As a general guideline, I suggest that for any contracts that are valued at under $10,000, they should be able to be read in under five minutes. If it's uh, $100,000 or less, then okay, 10 minutes. The problem is many companies use lengthy multiple page contracts regardless of the amount that the contract is for, forcing our customers to spend way too much administrative time and frankly, causing them to resent doing business with us before they sign the contract. Bear in mind that when you have lengthy multi-page contracts, it says to the customer that the company has either been sued in the past or anticipates being sued in the future. Well, that doesn't exactly instill confidence on the part of the customer. So I have a question for you if your company does use contracts, and that is, how long does it typically take your customers to read your contracts? And I'm going to ask you to post it below in the comment section. Is it A, can they read a contract in five minutes or less? Or B, can your contracts be read in six to 10 minutes? Or finally, is it C, over 10 minutes long? And I guess the question to ask is, when was the last time you actually read through one of your own contracts to see how long it does take and whether it's time to update it, refresh it? Okay, that brings us to customer experience turnoff number three, and that is disclaimer disconnect. No doubt that at some point or another, you as a customer have probably received emails from people who near the bottom of the email, it has this disclaimer with all this legalese. So for example, it'll say something like, this, this message, message is confidential and intended solely for the person named here. here. It, it may contain information that is privileged, confidential, or exempt from disclosure. If you are not the intended recipient, files may not be shared. Or so help us, we will demand satisfaction. It will be pistols at dawn, you cad. Name your second. Okay, okay, well, that last part is probably an exaggeration, but I think you get the idea. 
These confidentiality disclaimers at the end of emails imply that as the recipient, you are legally bound and liable to not share it with anyone. Nonsense. Doesn't hold any legal weight at all. Just because somebody says in an email that you shouldn't share this doesn't mean that you have an agreement not to share it. If somebody doesn't want you to share any information, you should sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, or uh, make a separate arrangement that you're not going to share it. But the reality is those non-disclosure statements are completely worthless legally. All it does is make it sound like you as an organization are run by lawyers. There's a lot of bureaucracy and it gets in the way of clear communication with the customers. So I suggest you just skip them altogether. Now, by the way, I know your company is probably going to say, oh no, we can't do that. Well, we have a difference of opinion on that. And the whole idea is to make it easier for your customers to be able to relate to you. The fact is they're worthless anyway. Just get rid of them. If you're finding this video to be helpful, well, I think you'll love my tips. You'll find them for free at jeffsbusinesstips.com. Now, remember I said that this last customer turnoff is the one I see most often? Well, here it is. Customer turnoff number four is faceless front line. One of the most common customer annoyances, and, and perhaps the easiest to eliminate, is where frontline employees don't identify themselves to the customer. In other words, they're either they don't wear name tags, or when they're interacting with someone, they don't identify who they are. And this is such an easy thing to remedy. And the idea of sharing who you are is not, well, it actually does two things. First, it implies status, that you're important enough, the person should know who they are. But when you introduce yourself, and specifically when you introduce yourself with your first and your last name, it tells the person that you are comfortable being held accountable, which is why you're volunteering your first and last name. It's an easy error to correct and one that builds trust. So my bottom line question out of all of this for you is, what do you really like as an organization to work with? I encourage you to check your customer communication practices and see if you could sound a little less guarded and a little more open for doing business. I'm Jeff Mowat. I hope you found this to be helpful. And again, if you like this video, I think you'll love my tips. You'll find them for free at jeffsbusinesstips.com. See you next time.